Today my uh, sermonette is on the eighth fruit of the Spirit, which is uh, meekness. Some translations use gentleness. And with gentleness and meekness, you have to have humility. Humility is required. Humility is the quality or state of not thinking you're better than other people. It's the quality of not being proud. And uh, the Apostle Paul, I think, said it best in Philippians when he said, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. So the title of my sermonette today is uh, Meekness, Gentleness, and Humility. In the rough and tumble of our embrace of 21st century, humility is scarcely considered a virtue. Such qualities as meekness and gentleness are not the sort that most people seek in order to succeed. We are a fast-moving, masterful, permissive people who, when the cradle learn to shove and push and scream and scramble to get ahead. Fiercely we contend for our rights, believing the strange philosophy that to be big, bold, and brazen is best. We subscribe to the idea that since no one else will blow my, my horn for me, I must blow my own bugle loudly and long. We are completely convinced that unless we make our mark in the world, we will be forgotten and the crush obliterated from the memory by the people around us. From the hour we begin to take our first feeble frightened steps as a tiny tot, we are exhorted to stand on your own feet. We are urged and encouraged to make it on your own. We are told to make your own decisions. We are stimulated to be aggressive, self-assertive, and very self-assured. All of these attributes we are, we are sure will lead to ultimate greatness. And in the face of all this comes to us a distinct shock to hear our Lord declare, whoever soever shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Somehow in our society, humility and greatness are thought to be mutually exclusive. Consequently, many Christians are confronted on this point with the necessity of making some sort of mental, emotional, volitional adjustment. Where does truth lie here? Who has the secret of success? Does one adopt the view of contemporary culture or the rather unpleasant position of Jesus Christ who stated without hesitation, let him who would be greatest amongst you be your servant. This quality of life that produces humility in the human spirit bestows upon us a truly balanced view of ourselves and others. We see the greatness and goodness in our God and in others around us. Likewise, it enables us to see ourselves as we really are. We see our own relative insignificance in the great mass of mankind, yet we also see we are of great worth to God who has called us from darkness into the light of his own love. We see ourselves as sinners, yet at the same time those who have been saved from their despair to become the sons of God. So it is the generosity of our God, the kindness of Christ, the patience, perseverance of his Holy Spirit drawing us to himself that humbles our pretentious, our haughty hearts. And it is the indwelling of his own gentle, gracious spirit that displaces our arrogance and our self-preoccupation. It is the spirit of the living God who bestows upon us the capacity to express genuine concern and compassion for others. His selfless self-giving enables us to treat others with courtesy and consideration. And this caliber of humility, meekness, and gentleness came at a great cost. Christ laid down his life for us. He identifies himself with us in our dilemma. Utterly merciful, total, total compassionate, incredibly self-giving. He has our welfare and well-being ever in mind, always. And if we are to see this humility, this meekness at its best, we must look at the life of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross what lengths he went to become identified with us struggling mortals in the web of our sins 
he descended to deliver us from our dilemma of despair. What humiliation he undertook deliberately to rescue and redeem us from the enemy of sin and death. Yet, it cost a great deal to experience and to know true humility and meekness. For most people, its price is prohibitive. They simply will not pay it. There is a real buyer's resistance to the cost of gentleness and meekness among us. We simply do not wish to become of no reputation. We want no part of playing the suffering servant. We refuse to become doormats on whom others wipe their feet without compunction, remorse. We are not excited by involvement with the weak and the hopeless and the sorrowful. We are not attracted by the man of sorrows. There is nothing glamorous about this one. Like so many others, we tend to despise and reject such submissiveness. And unless we keep clearly in view the life and character of Christ, we will succumb to the eternal temptation of living like the rest of the world, giving tit for tat, insisting on our rights, demanding our pound of flesh, stepping on anyone who trespasses against us, all the time pushing for prominence and recognition. This is the world's way. Christ calls to tread in his footsteps. He tells us to deny ourselves daily, give up our rights to ourselves. He asks us to take up our cross continuously. The humility of Christ, the meekness of his Holy Spirit, the gentleness of our God can only be known, seen, felt, and experienced by a tough world in the lives of God's people. In a world that cheers when athletes smash into each other and applauds insults as a form of entertainment, is gentleness even relevant anymore? When we hear the word gentle, we might think of a mother picking up her infant son from a crib. She softly holds him and cradles his head moving slowly and not holding so tight as to squeeze him. We might also think of an archaeologist on a dig, patiently and carefully unearthing the artifacts with the slow strokes of his or her delicate instruments. Now instead, imagine that mother gripping the baby by the leg and dragging him out of the crib like a sack of potatoes. Also imagine the archaeologist getting a shovel and chopping hard at the ground above the artifact, smashing against the precious piece of history. Which examples better describe how people in the world treat each other overall? Even after thoroughly pointing out the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus Christ defined the spirit of gentleness and showed how he truly felt about even those who were opposed to him. And in Matthew 23, 37, he lamented, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Gentleness is feeling this way about other human beings. So now would you please open your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. It's Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. And in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, Christ said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Here Christ makes a connection between gentleness and humility. This connection is also seen elsewhere in the Bible. The Apostle Paul reinforces this idea in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lonely among you, but being absent and bold towards you. Paul included the word meekness and lowly in conjunction with gentleness. These words help show that gentleness requires humility because along with pride and feelings of superiority come rough reactions and stubborn know-it-all answers. So what is gentleness? It's a humble and meek attitude of wanting to help other people instead of wanting to be superior to them. This attitude flows from a spirit of real love for the individual, having true out outgoing concern for their well-being. Such an attitude is shown in how we think about and treat others and what we say to them. And why does God want us to demonstrate gentleness? And Philippians 4, 5 tells us to let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Why does God want those he is working with to be concerned about how gently they think or act or talk? God has all the power in the universe. 
and he is gentle with us, and he wants us to learn to be like him, then when he grow, gives us power, he will know that we will not use it cruelly or rashly. As we have seen, humility is closely connected with gentleness, so we need to consider how God views humility. And in James 4, 6 and 1 Peter 5, 5, both say, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And they're quoting Proverbs 3.34. God resists pride, including our prideful justifications for not being gentle to those who have offended us, who have been harsh to us, or who we don't feel deserve gentleness. These attitudes are prideful, lead to rationalizing away the need to be gentle. God wants us to show the same gentleness that Christ showed to the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8. Instead of being full of pride and self-righteously casting the first stone as a, at a sinner, we are to follow the example of Christ gently telling someone to go and sin no more. This is an example of gentleness God wants us to learn from him. A wonderful example of how clever and appealing gentleness can be is found in Acts 17. When Paul began his message to the Athenians, he clearly took into account the background and situation of the people with their many gods. He started out by noting how they were very religious and proceeded to comment on one altar he had seen with the inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. This was a gentle way of easing people out of the idea of dozens of gods into the idea of the true God. Even though some mocked, others asked to hear more, and some even joined and believed. Imagine if Paul had not been gentle in this situation, if he had said, men of Athens, you have sinned greatly with your terrible gods. You are very ignorant about anything religious. Pray for mercy that you evil sinners may not be struck down as the wicked. Would he have any takers? Probably not. Here Paul proves Proverbs 15.1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Two of the disciples provided an example of a lack of gentleness. The story is found in Luke 9, chapter 9, and involves Jesus Christ traveling to Jerusalem with his disciples. When they tried to pass through a Samaritan village, the people there did not receive him since he was continuing on to Jerusalem. James and John, who were also known as the sons of thunder in Mark 3.17, asked Jesus if he wanted them to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them as Elijah did. And Christ rebuked them and answered, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man came, did not come to destroy lies, but to save them. Jesus Christ was interested in serving, serving these people, not in vengeful and in prideful displays of power. He displayed what is found in Ezekiel 33:11, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn from your way, turn, turn from your evil ways. James and John, to whom Jesus had given the nickname of the sons of thunder, still had much to learn from Jesus' example of helping those people come to repentance. So, how are we doing in the fruit of the Spirit of meekness and gentleness? Were we gentle in the situations we faced this past week? If not, why? Were our rationalizations prideful? Do we exhibit the same gentleness to others that God exhibits to us every day? Do people describe us as gentle? Or do they describe us as critical or brash? Do we gently encourage people to sin no more? Or do we self-righteously cast the first stone? Gentleness is typically regarded as something that is weak, mild, or non-assertive. But when we consider it, it is a result, it is a fruit of God's Holy Spirit being active in our lives. And that being gentle requires the strength of self-control, thoughtfulness, tact and concern, we see it in an entirely different way. Modern examples of gentleness are distinctly uncommon. And how do we stay above the harsh, cruel, and angry world around us? We need to apologize quickly after rants and emotional outbursts. We are human beings with powerful emotions, and these will happen 
but a gentle person will realize how the things they said mine have affected others and will apologize and seek to make amends and seek to gain the self-control that will prevent such outburst in the future. Remind ourselves of God's gentleness with us. Chances are we would not want to be on the receiving end of our own gentleness and that is a problem. How would we want God to correct us or point something out to us the way we do to others? Many times, probably not. Think about what our attitude looks like. For example, when we see someone doing something wrong, is our club ready to bash some heads or instead is our notebook out with ideas of how to help someone overcome sin? Getting these pictures in our heads often make us aware of our lack of gentleness and will eventually get us reaching for the notebook or the Bible rather than the harsh words for the club. Being gentle doesn't mean that we should not be strong in our beliefs, but it does simply imply that we should be wise and loving and expressing those beliefs to others. God shows tough love and teaches hard lessons to humans, all the while being the very definition of gentleness. Now it is our turn.